Oh, <sighs> this is a video I've been considering as probably one of the hardest ones I've had to make all year. This video was prompted by a playlist collaboration with Cult Popcher called The Director Project. They're reaching out to video SES to cross the platform to focus on directors at the start of each month. Last time a bunch covered Steven Spielberg and his movies, and this month it's all about Hayao Miyazaki, head of one of the most artistically idolized film studios in the world. No pressure. And the reason I come to such hesitation on a project like this is that, simply put, I'm not much of an artsy guy. Deep diving into thematic discussions and highlighting a perspective in a film is not something that comes too naturally to me. Simple review critiques and exploring the speculation of new ideas is more my kind of forte. And I certainly don't have an arsenal of random artistic trivia knowledge like some other essayists I watch do. But nevertheless, when watching most Miyazaki films, it's clear to everyone watching that the tone and approach of his storytelling is something that can't be perceived as anything less than beautiful, beautiful art. And a personal favourite of mine has to come in the form of this, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Everything about this film just captivates me. The story, the theming, the execution, the world, the performances, the music, and the scale. I love the steampunk, dieselpunk kind of genre, and this kind of film absolutely scratches that itch. And yet, as someone who mostly looks at films with just a story or world in mind, I can't help but feel that the importance of a film like this is so much greater than I can properly enunciate. The general premise behind Nausicaa follows a post-apocalyptic world set a thousand years after the Seven Days of Fire, a fiery explosive war that destroyed civilization and gave bloom to a vast toxic jungle. Now only small factions remain of humankind and those that do survive are crushed under the growing spread of the toxins of the forest and the gigantic mutant insects that reside in it. Amidst the dire circumstances stands Nausicaa, Princess of the Wind Valley, a small village that has learned to coexist near the toxins thanks to the protection given from the wind in their region and the use of controlled small bursts of fire. And though everyone fears this looming toxic threat, Nausicaa is the one to see the true beauty in its nature and resolves to cure its poison through purification rather than overt fire and force, as two neighbouring kingdoms have chosen to do. And it's funny, because there are some very obvious themes to be taken from this story. It's incredibly environmentalist and awfully anti-war and anti-violence, preaching the act of harmony, love and the value of life in all forms. But while I could sit here and ramble about the extreme ideas that us humans are the real toxins in the natural world or whatever, I don't think that's really what I want to do. Whenever I imagine a Studio Ghibli film, the exact same vision always comes to mind. It's the deep blue sky and the saturated green grass. Every time, the combination of those two colours are always what jumps straight to me. Every time I see it, I'm blown away. And it's just because even reality doesn't look that good. I've been to green fields before on a nice sunny day, but nothing holds a candle to the fantasy world of these Studio Ghibli films. And it's especially the case for me as a colourblind person. It's somewhat saddening to know that as I look around my real world surroundings, I will never see this particular tone of sky blue, or this saturated green in the grass and the specks of yellow flowers within them. I literally can't see them IRL. Heck, even the images of the fields I'm looking at now isn't as blooming as the ones you're likely seeing. And maybe that's why I was never really much of an artsy kid. I mean, why should I care about all these paintings and colour palettes when, to me, they're just muted, ununique schmuck in my faded eyes? So then, why is it when I look at this, even with no kind of lush green lands to look at, why is it even the apocalyptic wasteland of Nausicaa somehow speaks out to me? Technically pre-Ghibli, but whatever. Why is it when fields in my own hometown and artistic masterpieces made by legends have no inkling of an effect on me, yet something as dilapidated as this world is the thing that speaks to me? I don't really know. I don't have art references to sporadically bring up to connect you to some emotion I felt at some particular scene in this movie. But the few long-term images I have retained, I guess you could call art at a stretch of the imagination. Apocalyptic worlds, while often not exactly bursting with colour most of the time, have always pulled me in just through the imaginative fantasy of exploring something new with practically no rules attached. 
The idea of rummaging through a destroyed home to piece together the story of its heyday, all the while seeing the valued items that fill its remains available to be collected, always fills me with this sense of childlike exploration. Four years ago, I was captivated by this one article I saw of a 27-year-old photographer, Kiao Wei Long, who had snuck into radioactive ghost towns in Fukushima following a nuclear rupture in 2011 thanks to natural disasters. What he came to find was a world entirely frozen in time. The townspeople were forewarned and evacuated in a hurry before earthquakes and tsunamis plagued the lands. What remains five years later is an eerie sense of quiet chaos. People had left in such a hurry that clothes would still be found in the laundromats, cars were often left parked permanently, and anything loose was quickly spread across the floor, either from the initial panicked motion or the earthquake that followed. The magazine shop I particularly remember for how each issue was intrinsically dated and forgotten to time. A boxed PlayStation 2 was simply cast aside in the wreckage, supermarket items piled upon the now non-visible floor, and calendars were permanently marked as March 11th, 2011. The people were long gone, but the essence of their livelihood still remained in small parts across this radioactive danger zone. Despite the context of unavoidable disasters, human error, fear of mortality and abandoning one's home and belongings, when I look at these kind of photos, I see a kind of… beauty in all of it. I'd want to read the magazines and explore for myself if there wasn't such a thick chemical smell in the air and a supposed burning sensation on the eyes. And hey, if you're liking my stuff so far, do consider subscribing. This is a little bit different from the normal format that I do, but hopefully, hopefully I'm doing okay so far. I've been very nervous to make this. Anyway, only you can help help with my, you know, skewed unsub ratio count. The nerves are showing, excuse me. <laughs> Much like Nausicaa, seeing the peace of the natural world like this fills me with a morbid sense of motivation in the melancholy of it all. But I think beyond just the doom and gloom concept of this post-apocalyptic world, what really drives more of the fantastical immersion for me is just the pure scale of the world we see throughout the film's runtime. Sure, I've seen Lord of the Rings a handful of times and watched a lot of walking scenes, but the true scale of journey I've never fully grasped. But what really helps in Nausicaa's case is the newfangled sci-fi airship that is her glider giving us this futuristic joy of being able to just spew across the lands at a jet's pace, whilst also blessing us with these gigantic, beautiful landscapes of small moving parts against a much bigger picture. These are probably some of my favourite shots in the movie, just in being able to capture yet more beauty in an otherwise barren and plagued desert. And then following on from that, this glider isn't the only one of its kind. Yeah, okay, I realise Miyazaki kinda has a thing for airships in most of his movies, but even in just Nausicaa alone, there's the sci-fi jet design, the steampunk archaic one, the domineering diesel punk ships, and of course the Cooper clown car. And while they represent different factions in their own ways, they also hint to this overriding idea that yes, this world's habitability is hanging on by a thread, and yet humans are still thriving, at least technologically. Although shrinking in landmass, the humans that remain have built these vast machines that allow them to traverse the in-betweens in mere moments, enabling them to outpace even the largest of insects and granting them powerful yet dangerous weapons on both the world they inhabit and onto each other. While I wouldn't want to live in the world of Nausicaa per se, the positives that have arisen make me kind of jealous that this kind of thing isn't within my grasp. But moving on from just the beauty and awe the world gives me, there is a glaring conflict that comes about in this world. And it's the humans. Not necessarily against the natures of the world, according to the final messaging of the film. No. It's always been between each other. The politically charged actions between neighbouring factions that clash to impact everybody. With the examples of the kingdoms in the film, there's the Tolmikians who intend to retake back control of the planet for humankind by reviving an ancient warrior to burn and destroy the toxic jungle, and then there's the Pejite who oppose the Tolmikians having such a dominating weapon and are willing to abuse insect kind in order to do their bidding. 
All the while Nausicaa in the middle has learned that fire is only good in small doses and that harmony should instead be achieved. In fact, burning down the jungle in the first place will only lead to more pollution than ever before thanks to its secret purifying properties underground. Now I didn't watch this film until I was in my 20s, so I don't know how I'd really react to the politics as a kid. But as an adult, especially in these times, the discussion of the actions of our leaders is something that totally resonates with me more as it's grown more prevalent and toxic in the real world. I mean, literally as this was being written and recorded, the US elections were in its standstill the entire time. But while politics is usually about the dramas of the day, always moving ahead to the next scandal, the next debate, the next replacement member, the politics in this film dwells on the lingering political issues in the backs of all of our minds. You know the one. In the 1960s, science was just coming to grasp the warming effect of carbon dioxide gas. In the 70s, scientists favoured that this was our reality. By the 80s, we were long overdue for some action, and by the 90s, it was blasphemy to still be ignoring the elephant in the room. In the 2000s, what we were doing was beyond ignorant. But hey, at least in the 2010s, the UK got some paper straws and a 5p charge for using plastic bags. Progress. How long will it be before some serious diverting changes are to be made by our world leaders? In Nausicaa, the world was destroyed thanks to weapons of mass destruction and the effects were felt for a thousand years. Is this fantasy land with jet gliders and mutant insects really our real future? Maybe not the insects, but the issue of climate change is something all of us constantly forget. General opinion in most places seems to agree that it does exist, but the moment it's not being preached and protested about, it just gets archived in the back of our minds while more short-term, smaller issues take the forefront. It's not necessarily an evil trait of ours, it's just basic human psychology. We do it everywhere for the efficiency of our brains and our memories. We do it with the idea of the torturous meat industry that we probably don't agree with, but if it's not on screen, it's not in our minds anymore. Same can be said with any particularly bad news we hear thousands of miles away or even nearby. Or hell, we even do it on a personal level when grieving over a lost one. We don't think about them every waning moment, and a lot of times we just sort of… forget for a while. How much longer can we forget before it's unforgettable and unavoidable? And what's interesting as I dug into Nausicaa research more is that none of the characters are fully set in stone to be evil figures, because for the most part, that isn't reality. Instead, Miyazaki says that some characters embody the Buddhist roots of evil, delusion, ill will and greed, with fear being the driving force behind every bad decision, a totally normal and understandable human emotion. Other details I found while looking deeper are the obvious connections to anti-war and nuclear weaponry, which is pretty clear cut, as well as a reflection to the Cold War going on at the time of the production in the 80s, but I kinda think that topic is a little out of my field as a 20-something Brit. Still, what I find speaks to me far more on a spiritual level is the sense of childlike wonder put onto the development of this world. Every landscape looks like an amazing spectacle that begs to be explored. It takes me back to days as a kid where I wanted to own a wooden sword from Twilight Princess just to swing around at trees nearby to my house. That sense of feeling like a mini hero against a growing unknown land, ever optimistic that there was some happy ending waiting for me on an adventure in any direction. Looking at that idea now as an adult, things seem extensively more grim. A happy ending isn't guaranteed on this adventure. The idea of heroism isn't just a career path you can really pick up, and even the likes of being into swords has had its stigmas in public discord in a sense. It's not about grabbing a weapon and swinging towards some mutual enemy anymore. Doing the right thing has expanded to a global sized battle of geographically engineering our planet's landscapes and protesting against the reins of monopolizing corporations fueling our planet's ecological downfall. That's certainly less fun than the tones of a new Zelda game. But at the end of the day, it's an adventure we're all on together, for better or worse. And though this abstract feat sounds monumental in scale to us as individuals or even as a species, it also brings to mind those space images we received in the 90s, the pale blue dot. Recreated a handful of times by any far-flung spacecraft, that pale blue dot is always us, our entire history, our entire livelihood, 
everything we have ever done and are currently doing, and potentially ever will do, just a speck of dust amongst an endlessly expanding landscape, and the view from up here helps put everything into perspective. The task of reshaping the system of our energy consumption to change the course of our planet's climate is monumental, but this dot, thank you alarm, but this dot is all we have. It can be taken away just as easily as any other element of our being, recognisably diminished in scale by these slapbacks to reality. But while the kingdoms of Nausicaa are unaware of the positive futures of their reality or the dangers of their direct actions set in motion, we have an advantage in reality. We can totally foresee what's coming. We're aware of the negative impact we're causing. We know theoretically how to resolve our problems, and we know what kind of future awaits us in both the good and the bad ending. It all comes down to uniting our actions as a collective that our conflict arises. It's not the inhabitability of the world that's the issue, it's the conflicting humans that live in it. Arguing on the small, unimportant short-term problems over the long-term gigantic threats. Now more than ever, there's a growing mist of unrest amongst us, and rage. Politics is an uncomfortable conversation. Every day, more and more of us become blind with rage, fuming at the prospects of others' opinions and the actions that follow. Divided across a growing number of labels and categories, when in reality, we're all in the same storm. Some of us have better boats than others, but if we're all hit by the same massive waves, we'll all be forced to face the same fate. Environmentalism is uncomfortable, easier to forget at the back of our minds, much like the reality behind non-vegetarianism or anything overtly negative to hear. And while there is much beauty in the way that Miyazaki makes Nausicaa unfold, what with its beautiful colours, wonderful messaging, masterful execution, and gripping story rife with fantastical machines, practical opinions, and loving relationships, the point it brings up is excruciatingly worrisome in a reflective sense. As a kid, I would love this movie for the open-eyed optimism of a world ready to be explored, with a hero story in the centre, a love for the natural world, and a scale unlike anything I've properly been able to fathom before. And as an adult, I love this film for its fantastic merging of a symbolic representation of our concurrent problems and realities, backdrop on an intriguingly grim yet optimistic premise. Miyazaki's Nausicaa has gone on to inspire the likes of many productions, Final Fantasy being the big one with those oh so obvious chocobos down there, but even other games I've played in the past give me some strong Nausicaa vibes. Shadow of the Colossus with its expansively dry world and gigantic beasts, and Pikmin with its tune to nature and oversized insects. Both bring with it a kind of environmentalist tone with how they explore the beauty of their natural yet dangerous expanses. Watching this film doesn't magically turn people into some wacky environmentalist eco-fascist. This film doesn't tell people to sacrifice others for the good of our planet or even speak to some people the same way it does to me. But I think, even to a small degree, it always revives that uncomfortable conversation in the back of our minds. And while some may still focus on the youthful desire to be a sword-swinging adventurer while they watch this story unfold, for me, I always come back to those blue skies and green fields I always associate with Ghibli. I wonder if, even though I can't see the true saturation of this image, will it always linger as boldly and as colourfully as it can in our reality? Will there be a day when these vibrant signs of life fade into a progressively paler small dot out in the great expanse? Is our future one with a last minute shift as time quickly creeps up on us? Or will we too be cast into the backs of the minds of our planet, frozen in time in a world where evidence of our existence lingers, but us ourselves are long gone, taken away in an instant where natural disasters rendered us obsolete? I don't have an answer for us. I have opinions, sure, as everybody else does, but before we can even begin to address the real problem directly, we'd have to overcome the blinding rage our societies have developed upon themselves before we can tackle the slow burn that is a super sped natural downfall. Will we develop the technology to coexist with the new reality we've brewed and discuss the uncomfortable conversation with those with other priorities? 
Or will it remain forgotten for now, distracted by the fun of a fantasy world, or a new, minute, yet angeringly prioritised conflict, only to be forgotten ever more against a continually shrinking pale blue dot? To think it was all brought out thanks to the performances of a 2005 Shia LaBeouf, Patrick Stewart and Mark Hamill, and a story twice as old as me. Hopefully in another 24 years, we won't be bringing up the same old conversation. For now though, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. Thank you to Pop Culture for letting me be involved in this little collaboration. It's been very fun, very unique spin on things. I've been very nervous to make it, and hopefully it's not an angering video. It is politics, so we'll see. But I had a lot of fun, so, you know, it was a good time. Yeah, thanks for making it this far along as well. It's very new. You're, you're, you're the very small minority. Not a lot of people make it this far, so I love you the most. <laughs>